morning, church family. This morning we will be looking at a portion of Psalm 51, which has a special message for several groups of people. First, Psalm 51 is for those who have never come to grips with the horror of human sin and the magnitude of divine grace. Often grace becomes meaningless and certainly less than amazing because we lose sight of the depths of our depravity. David helps us on both counts by describing in graphic detail the reality of his sin and the breathtaking glory of forgiving grace. Secondly, this psalm is for those who think some people are too high or too holy to fall. Let us never forget that this psalm describes the experience of David, king of Israel, the man after God's own heart, as you read in 1 Samuel 13 14. Third, this psalm is also for those who think that once you have fallen, you can never get back up again. It is for those who think it's impossible to fall beyond the reach of God's grace and forgiveness, or that there is a quantifiable limit to divine mercy. But no one is so holy that they can't fall, or so fallen that they can't be forgiven. Fourth Psalm 51 is for those who think that if you have fallen and have actually got back up, and perhaps even been forgiven, you are still useless from that point on to both God and the church. David's experience will prove, prove otherwise. The historical, historical setting for the psalm is stated in the psalm's superscription. To the choir master, Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. None of us likes to have our struggles and problems broadcast publicly, much less our sins of the flesh. But here we are told that this psalm was written to the choir master. Imagine what it would be like for your worst sins to be projected on the screen at church and set to music for the corporate worship of God's people. The psalm is a remarkable and in many ways unparalleled description of the nature of conviction, confession and forgiveness. But at the same time we celebrate with David the joy of having one's sins washed clean. Sam Storm states that we dare not forget that his transgressions yielded significant and far-reaching consequences. Among these were the denunciation by Nathan and the public shame it brought, the death of David and Bathsheba's son, the rebellion of Absalom, the total um, the trouble with affairs of state, for example, the revolt of Sheba. The lesson that uh, it learned here is that where a sin is certainly personal, in many cases it is anything but private, as its consequences impact upon others. So on what basis does David ask for acquittal in verses 1 and 2? Does he appeal to his track record as king of, over Israel? Does he remind God of how many psalms he has written and how much of a blessing it has been to God's children? Does he cite his faithful service or marshal forth a long list of character witnesses? No, not in the least. He doesn't expect to be forgiven based on his sincerity or spiritual intensity or deep pain for having sinned or fervor of heart, or promise not to sin again, or his depth of determination to somehow make it up to God. That's not to say his sincerity and zeal and conviction aren't important, but David's appeal is based on what he knows of God's mercy and compassion and steadfast love. Note the three words David uses in verses 1 and 2 to describe his sin. If nothing else, it indicates on his part an acknowledgement that it is sin and not just some trivial mistake. He calls it a transgression, which should be defined as a willful, self-assertive defiance of God, an iniquity, which is a deviation from the right path, and also a sin, which in simple terms is a missing of the divine mark. Equally vivid are the three words he uses in his plea for forgiveness. He asks God to blot out his transgression, to erase it from the record, and to wipe it away. He beseeches the Lord to wash him from his sin, verse 2b. Uh, this word was often used of a woman first saturating a garment with lye soap and then treading it under a foot on a rock, beating and pummeling it as the rushing waters poured over it. One can almost hear David tearfully praying, Gracious Lord, do that to my spirit. My sin is like a deep dyed stain that has sold the fabric of my soul and no ordinary soap or detergent, far less any good works I might perform, can remove it. My transgressions are like ground in dirt. Lord, scrub me clean by your mercy and grace. And then finally, the word cleanse was one used for ceremonial purification in the Old Testament. Uh, 
when David turns in verses 3 and 4 to confess the magnitude of his sins, his language is no less graphic. Edward Dalgleish writes, The sin is not vaguely expressed and in a neutral context, but intensely personal, mine. And he's so described five successive times in the first three verses. True penitence is not a dead knowledge of sin committed, but a vivid, ever-present consciousness of it. Thus poignantly affected by this fixation of sin and dominated by a feeling of complete submission, the psalmist opens the hidden world of his soul, exposing his guilt-written conscience. David makes no excuses. He offers no rationalizations and refuses to shift the blame as we saw in Genesis 3 when God confronted Adam after he and Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit after being tempted by Satan. With David, there's no insanity plea or appeal to diminish capacity that we would see and hear in a 21st century courtroom situation. Instead, my sin, he says, is ever before me in verse 3b. It is no intermittent flash, but a perpetual obsession, a sight from which he can never turn away. It is, as it were, seared on the inside of his eyelids. He sees it all the time. Worse still, it is a sin ultimately against God alone. Verse 4a. But how can it be against God only if he committed an adultery with Bathsheba, if he conspired to kill her husband Uriah, disgraced his own family, and even betrayed the trust of the nation of Israel? Perhaps David would argue that whereas one commits crimes against people, one sins only against God. More likely still, as Perone writes, face to face with God, he sees nothing else, no one else, can think of nothing else but his presence forgotten, his holiness outraged, his love scorned. David is so broken that he has treated God with such disregard that he is blinded to all other aspects or objects of his behavior. David's confession is not simply to get things off his chest, as if confession were merely a therapeutic release of sorts. His confession is designed to tell everyone that God was in the right all along, that God's judgment, judgment was true, just, and that the Almighty is blameless. Verse 4b. How long has David had this problem with sin? Did it start with puberty? Was he turned to the dark side by some childhood or teenage trauma? The problem, says David, isn't so much that I sin, the problem is that I am sinful and always have been. These deeds of the flesh are symptomatic of a much deeper problem. The fact is, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Verse 5, he confirms that his transgressions are not of recent vintage. This was no freak one-off event. He's been a sinner from the time he entered his mother's womb. Thus David confesses his, his hereditary sin as the root cause of his actual sin in verse 4. But he makes no effort to vindicate himself on that basis. In explaining his sinfulness by reference to the natural propagation of the species, David moves beyond his birth in verse 5a to the very genesis of his being in the womb of his mother, indeed to the very moment of conception in verse 5, 5b. However, David is not trying to accuse his mother in order to excuse himself. As Henry Blocher in Original Sin writes, the focus of the entire psalm is the personal accountability of David. No one is to blame but he alone. His point is, is simply, that, simply that his very being is shot through and through with the tendencies that produce the fruits of adultery and murder. As far as he can go, he sees his life as being sinful. In other words, David's problem, yours and mine too, isn't that we commit an individual acts of sin, the problem is that we have a constitutional propensity to sin. What we need most isn't a new lifestyle, but new life. Not new habits, but a new heart. And what hope is there for this? Well, that's where the good news of the gospel comes in. Just as David needed to be pardoned by a sovereign, almighty, merciful God, so too do we, as normal members of the human race, need to be forgiven for our sins that we commit all too often, with our deeds, tongues, thoughts, and even at times our inaction, when we remain unmoved by the Lord's prompting us in our day-to-day -day lives over certain issues. The most well-known and often proclaimed verse in the Bible is John 3.16, where John describes how God has loved us to the extent that, that he sent his one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins.
the promises made that whosoever believes in Jesus, that is, puts their trust, trust and faith in him and turns from their evil ways, will not perish, but will receive the gift of eternal or everlasting life. At the very moment of profession of faith in Christ Jesus, the new birth is received and the Holy Spirit is given as a deposit to indwell the believer until they meet the Lord face to face, either when he comes to fetch the church at the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 15 to 18, or else when the believer goes to be with him at the end of their lives on earth. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6, Paul writes that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Certainly good news for us and a certain hope for the future. Father, we thank you for the lessons learned in this beautiful psalm written by an amazing man, David, a man after your own heart, who was able to do the most incredible exploits for you, but yet at the same time had the inner human self-centeredness to sin against you in order to satisfy the lusts of his flesh. We might not, not have sinned to the same extent he did, Lord, but given the same opportunities he had, we might well have done likewise. Father, just as you cleansed and pardoned David of his sin, after his confrontation with Nathan, we pray that you would do likewise with each one of us as we confess our sin to you and ask for your forgiveness. These things we pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Thank you.